Um, thank you very much, Julie, for your introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming today for the talk. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm not an expert on this subject, no, I'm not an expert on Chinese drama, because I did not study drama before. I study history for my undergrad, and for my postgrad, I study art curating. Um, but I curated this exhibition because personally, I like Chinese drama, and I have a 93-year-old grandma who also likes Chinese drama as well. So that's what makes me um, to make this um, exhibition and to show more students um, the ancient collections in um, the Fisher Library. Um, today, we will talk about the author of Zhao, an influential Chinese drama. You might ask a question, why is it influential? Um, I think there are three reasons. Um, first is this play was written by Ji Junxiang in about, 18, uh, in about 1330 AD, so it was a long time ago. And um, the second reason is because this piece was the first piece of Chinese dramatic literature translated to a European language. And there are five European adaptations in the 18th century. Two in English, one in French, one in German, and one in Italian. And lastly, the Fisher Library has two very precious adaptations of the play, one by Voltaire in 1755 and one by Arthur Murphy in 1759. So they are both there, so it's very precious, um, original play in the 18th century, so you can have a look after the talk. And in today's talk, I will focus on the original play by Ji Junxiang and its adaptations especially the Voltaire's version, to explore a, a special type of cultural communication. So these are the cover of the two books over there. Let's talk about the original play. The playwright, Ji Junxiang. Little is known to Ji Junxiang except for except that he was the author of six plays. Most of his plays are lost. So with only six plays to his credit, Ji Junxiang cannot be compared with other famous uh, playwrights in the Yuan Dynasty, such as Guan Hanqing, uh, who is an author of 69 plays in the Yuan Dynasty. And about a story, this play is classified in the zha zhu genre of Chinese drama. So zha zhu is a very typical um, genre in the Yuan Dynasty, and it was written in around 1330 AD. And the play is divided into six parts. Um, it consists of five acts. In China, we call it zhe, uh, and one uh, xie zi. Uh, serve as a prologue uh, here. It was not common for a zha zhu to have five acts. The conventional number is four uh, for the zha zhu, so this one is like an ex uh, exceptional example to have five acts. So let's talk about the story. So the story begins with a military leader his name is Tu Angu, and he is a military leader, and he is determined to kill his political rival called Zhao Dun. And Zhao Dun is a great minister, and Zhao Dun has a son. His name is Zhao Shuo, and he is married to a princess. When Tu Angu are determined to kill the entire Zhao family, the tragedy happened. The princess gave birth to a baby boy who became an orphan. And Cheng Ying, a faithful friend and physician of the Zhao family, saves the life of orphan by concealing him. 
but he sacrificed his own son by telling Tuangu that, oh, this baby boy is the orphan, but actually he hide the orphan, he sacrificed his own son. So this is a very sad uh, story. When the orphan is brought up by Cheng Ying and he reaches his manhood, the truth is revealed. And he seeks vengeance for his family and kill Tuangu in the end. So this is the summary of the play. And there's a movie um, on YouTube that you can find about this um, original story. How authentic is the story? What are, its, what are the sources? To find an answer, we must go back to a famous Confucian classic called Spring and Optin, Chun Chiu, in which is recorded the story of the Zhou Kingdom. There are three commentaries, of which the best known is the commentary of Zuo, uh, the commentary for this uh, book. And that would be the ultimate source of the orphan of Zhao. Besides the commentary of Zuo, the story of Zhao family can also be found in the historical records, Shi Ji, uh, written by uh, a famous Chinese historian in the second century BC, uh, Sima Qian. Overall, there are little doubt that Ji Junxiang, uh, the original playwright, was indebted to historical writings and particularly to Sima Qian for the story of the orphan. As I mentioned before, the, of, um, the Orphan of Zhao has the distinction of being the first Chinese play to be rendered into a European language and a very uh, rare Chinese play that has left an imprint in Western drama. So the journey, it's a long journey, but it began in the 1731 when a French um, Jesuit missionary called uh, Joseph Henri Plumet, he translated the Orphan of Zhao and introduced this to the world. Why he did so? One explanation is that the spirit of self-sacrifice which the play exemplifies must have appealed to the Jesuit scholars or other Christians as a noble virtue. So he decided to translate this play and introduce to the Western world. And after this translation, the play, this play was officially published in 1735 in the third volume of Jean-Baptiste du Hautes. Um, I can't speak French, but like, as you can see here, his book is called A Description of China. So this is the first time that um, the Orphan of Zhao being published. And after the publishment, um, the story was well received throughout Europe because um, at that time in the 18th century, uh, European are very interested in Chinese culture, um, literature, um, like arts, decoration, etc. It also provides new angles to European writers for their drama writing. So um, it's a very successful um, uh, published uh, book. And after that, in 1741, William Hatchett published his own adaptation called The Chinese Orphan and uh, a his historical tragedy. So one of the most important changes made by Hatchett is the shortening of the time duration in the play. So in the original play, Ji Junxiang um, designed the play for lasts for 25 years, so it's very long. So it, it lasts for the whole, like, for the orphans from when he was an orphan until he grew up as an adult, so it's very long. But William Hatchett shortened the time duration and focused on the uh, revenge in the play. And in 1752, in Italy, 
um, another gentleman called uh, Petro Metastasio. He published his own adaptation. So this is Italian. Um, it's a three-act dramatic poem. But this adaptation contains very little of the original. Uh, and this, this um, adaptation set an example for later adapters, uh, including uh, Voltaire. So now is Voltaire's turn. So one of the books is, is over there, published in um, 1753. Uh, as you may know, Voltaire had a long um, admiration for Chinese culture, especially of Confucian philosophy. And he wanted to prove the power of morality. However, Voltaire had a very low opinion on the dramatic form of Chinese drama. It means that he liked, he appreciated the message of the play, but he did not agree with the, the theories or the dramatic forms or the dramatic patterns that the Chinese playwright used. Um, so I will discuss Voltaire's adaptation in details from two angles. Uh, firstly is his criticism on the Chinese dramatic form. And secondly, um, I will talk about the philosophical purport of the adaptation, um, his appreciation on the message of the play. So let's look at the story first. So instead of a tragedy of revenge, Voltaire changed the play as a moral piece, and he introduced a person called Genghis Khan, you, you might have heard of him. He is a very famous Mongolian conqueror. And before he conquered China, so it was a Chinese monarchy, and the Chinese monarchy had a royal orphan. So the royal orphan was entrusted to a guy, a general, called Santi. He is a Chinese official. Do you think he will sacrifice his own son in Voltaire's play? So that is the main change in the play, that um, he didn't do so, because he has a very virtuous wife called um, Idam. When um, his wife reproaches her husband for his cruelty by having the idea of sacrifice his own son, instead of sac sacrificing their own son, uh, Idam came to see Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan found out that, oh, Idam was the woman that he loved before. Before he conquered China, he, he loved um, his wife. And he tempts her to leave her husband and become the Chinese queen. But he was refused by Idam on ethical grounds. Then she went to prison. Now the fate of her husband, her son, and the orphan all depends on the answer, to, her answer to Genghis Khan if she will say yes or no uh, for his love. And um, this woman, Idam, is resolute to the end. She didn't change. And then she had an idea with her husband by saying that we might like commit suicide to show our commitment to the original Chinese monarchy. So when the suicide about to happen, Genghis Khan intrudes into their presence, and he was moved by the virtues of of them, and he pardoned all in the end. So that is the main differences between Vertel's adaptation and the original play. So the Genghis Khan was moved by the virtues.
So virtual become the best strategy which can be developed by any Congress, and Vertel has the idealism um, that virtual will conquer us all. And as a brave conqueror of China, he was conquered in the end by the virtual of Idam. So that is the, the change of uh, Votel um, compared to the original story. So why Votel made this adaptation? It was because he criticized the Chinese dramatic form. Um, because the Chinese drama failed to observe the principle of three unities. So the three unities um, is originally from Aristotle's Poetics, and it requires a play to have an action occurring in a single place and within the course of a day, so within 24 hours. But this, the original play, uh, written by Ji Junxiang, was too long. It lasts for 25 years. So Vertel was annoyed on this point. And also he criticized the intermixture of dialogue with songs, which makes the drama even longer. So he rewrite a Chinese play according to the rules of classical French drama and change the, um, the period within a, a, a 24 hours period and centered on the saving of orphan. So according to Vertel, he advanced the Chinese drama from dramatic infancy to mat uh, mat maturity by using the classical French theories, such as the three unities. But as I mentioned, even though Vertel criticized the dramatic forms of Chinese drama, he appreciated the philosophical ideas or the message behind the play, which is about virtues. Vertel calls the original play the morals of uh, the morals of Confucius in five acts. So it exemplifies at least three traditional Confucius virtues. First of all is Zhao Dun, the grandfather of the orphan. He is a righteous, faithful man but killed by Tuangu. Uh, so he demonstrates the concept of Zhong, loyalty to the ruling family. And secondly is Cheng Ying, the, the friend and the saver of the orphan. He saved the orphan and sacrificed his own son, which demonstrates his loyalty towards his friends. And lastly, the original play demonstrates Xiao, filial piety, because the orphan um, seek vengeance and kill Tuangu in the end. So that demonstrates um, the concept of filial piety. But in Voltaire's uh, adaptation, he changed the play as uh, he um, exaggerate. The, the, the message of virtual um, to a higher extent. And um, Genghis Khan was not only a conqueror of China, but he was also conquered by the wisdom of the general and the virtual of his wife. And he intended to inspire people um, at that time with a love of virtuals. So the success of uh, Voltaire's adaptation was not only confined to France alone, the play was acclaimed widely um, among Europe. In England, by the middle of the 18th century, Voltaire became an instrumental force in the drama. And in 1756, Arthur Murphy wrote his Orphan of China. And his play closely resembles Voltaire's play. So we have uh, an original um, editions over there as well by Arthur Murphy in the, in the 18th century. In conclusion, it must be said that The Orphan of Zhao is one of the very few works of Chinese literature that have influenced European writers. And it was the earliest Chinese drama to be known 
to Europe. And in the hands of Voltaire, it has become a moral comedy rather than a historical revenge, and he embodied in the adaptation his admiration for ancient China, for Confucianism, and his confidence in the triumph of morality and civilization, and a realization of his dramatic theories, such as the three unities I mentioned before. And finally, from all of these um, adaptations, from all this long journey, we can conclude that the European adaptation of the Orphan of Zhao in the 18th century were determined by different perceptions of China of the authors at that time. I think that's the end of my presentation. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask if um, within Chinese culture is this mm. playwright well known or has he fallen into obscurity over time within within China? Yeah. Um, I think he is little known, not well known in Chinese um, literature. Um, I haven't heard of him before. Before I researched this um, this uh, dra uh, this play, um, so I think in the Yuan Dynasty, the most famous uh, uh, playwright uh, is called Guan Hanqing, and he was the I think the first um, playwright being researched by uh, uh, Western uh, scholars. So Ji Junxiang himself is not well known or not it's not famous, and most of his plays. Uh, are lost. So only this one uh, is remained in the history. Yeah. And um, in the Yuan Dynasty, um, the social status of playwright were very low um, because um, the Yuan Dynasty it's a it's a it's a dynasty that focuses more on military, and they don't appreciate the. Confucius ideas and the Confucius scholars or the uh, literatis, the the, uh, the people who wrote uh, literatures uh, have a very low social status. Yeah, and um, not only at now, but back to that time, they are not well known as well. So the question is, um, have the European adaptation uh, been translated into Chinese as well? Mm. Um, in my knowledge, I can't see any Maybe, but not in an official book about the Yuan drama. You know, we have a, the dictionaries of the Yuan drama, and then the drama was the original play. It's not the adaptation written by uh, Arbotin or other author. But, but my, as I mentioned, my knowledge is very limited. So it might be, it, 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 maybe like someone published it. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah. This is a very good question. The question is, is the uh, a play being performed now in China or in greater China region? Uh, the answer is yes, especially in Taiwan and Hong Kong. They still perform this um, drama with their own adaptations. Yeah, so unfortunately I haven't, but I want to, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, I think it has a very long life from the 18th century up to now. It's still growing. Yeah, it's not an orphan anymore. It's an 
very mature adults. Yeah. genre, <laughs> yeah. This is a very good question. Um, the question is, what kind, uh, in terms of zhaju, what kind of genre it is? Uh, is it a tragedy or a comedy? Uh, this is a very good question because uh, when I'm doing this research, um, I found out that in Western culture, I'm not sure if I'm right or not. Um, people usually divide it genre, uh, drama between tragedy and comedy. But the distinction in Chinese drama is not clear. So most early Chinese plays are either comedies or including humorous parts. But we don't divide it as tragedy or comedy. But you know, like in, in Chinese drama, humor does not prevent a play from being sad. So it's not a huge distinction between tragedy and comedy. And uh, but in 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 Zhaju itself, this genre is very popular in the Yuan Dynasty, and um, its typical characteristic is called Yi Ben Si Zhe. Uh, what does it mean? It means like uh, Si Zhe means four acts. Usually, it contains four acts. Yi Ben means the the songs. Um, um, accompany the the drama is usually one to two songs, the tunes. So it's very strict. Most of the Yuan Zhaju will follow this principle: Yi Ben Si Zhe, four acts and one tune. Uh, and when history passed uh, in Qing or Ming dynasty, uh, we develop uh, another genre called. Uh, 明清传奇, uh, what is Ming Qingchuanqi? It's basically from local, like different provinces will have their different drama. Like I'm from Guangzhou, my local drama is called Cantonese Opera. So it's more localized, like different uh, plays will have their different local um, drama. Uh, so it's like from a very strict pattern, Yiban uh, Sijia in Yuan. And develop into Mingqing Chuanqi, a relatively loose pattern and more diversified, more, more, more diverse uh, in terms of the contents and in terms of the singing styles, more diverse. Yeah, so the question is um, um, the songs in the Zhaju genre, uh, uh, will people sing that uh, beyond, beyond the drama itself or will it be used in other uh, plays? The answer is yes, because the song is a, a, a development of something called Zhu Gong Biao in Chinese. Zhu Gong Biao, translated into English, is um, Mm, it's like a pattern that you follow. Uh, not only one play can use it, other plays can also use it. But the content that you sing will be different. Um, yeah, I think the answer your question. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, please join me again in thanking you. And, and lastly, I think if you are interested in this story, The Orphan of Jail, the quickest way for you to know the whole picture is to watch a movie called The Orphan of Jail by a famous uh, Chinese act, uh, director called Chen Tai Ge. And you can see some famous Chinese faces on, in the movie, uh, Fan Bingbing and also Ge Yo. They are very famous actors and actresses in China. China. So search on YouTube and you can you can you can watch the movie. Yeah.
Thank you.